Before we look at more issues in the news, permit me to welcome our review on the show this morning as we look to begin to review and critically dissect these news headlines. I'm joined by a gentleman of the fourth estate of the REM and an ardent economics on the show this morning in person of Mr. Defolarin Olamileko. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> now, there are a myriad of issues, and exactly. let's start with one of the <laughs> key mm. initiators of the current administration under exactly. President Bola Metinibu. Many mm. have called it a propaganda machinery. Mm. But yesterday, we saw a twist in the turn. Mm -hmm. A lot of persons have been saying, we want to see these buses physically. Mm. Nigerian commuters should be allowed to board these buses physically mm. and not on paper. Mm. We heard that the delay was owing to logistics and whatnot. Mm. But what do you make of yesterday's commissioning? of 30 hybrid CNG buses. We'd have those visuals greet the screen as we get your thoughts as well. It's quite a welcoming a welcoming development from the government, although the promise is 3,000 CNG buses. And not 30? Not 30. So we have just 2,970 still missing. So we have only 30 available for now. So we are hoping that maybe the government will bring the rest 2,970 buses out for Nigerians. Although many Nigerians still see the 30 as too shallow, too small, uh, it doesn't even show that the government is still serious about these CNG buses because that's what many Nigerians have been complaining since yesterday when this news broke. But we just have to encourage the government at this point in time, even though you have presented 30 to Nigerians, ensure that the rest 290, 970 buses are also launched, inaugurated, either at the state level or ESC in Nigeria or across the state level as well as local government. Once that is done, Nigerians will be set to and say the government will be very serious about the CNG buses because the government promised 30, I mean 3,000, not 30, has been shown right now. But on the other way, it's also been pointed that in, in as much as government have taken the lead in this CNG buses initiative, do the private sector also have the opportunity to also go into it? So oh, that we, we saw the NNPC mm. also in support to this mm. release a statement saying they would be supporting the government of President Bola Metinibu with 10 mm. of the hybrid CNG buses. Mm. You're talking about the private sector, but if the NNPC, as magnanimous as it mm -hmm. is, can only do 10, mm. how many private firms do you think would be capable to do so? They may do more. They may do more than NNPC. NNPC did 10. But they could do more than uh, uh, giving 10. But what I'm trying to say, in the large scale of it all, we need more buses. Because even by the time you share the three, if the federal government should bring out the 3,000, CNG buses, the permits out now. It may not be enough. Uh, that's the problem again. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. On sharing the 30 that was commissioned yesterday, mm -hmm. do you think that the focus would be only in the FCT and environment? Definitely. That would be for FCT. I don't think they will give it to any other state. So even Nasarawa that shares boundary with Abuja might not benefit? Mm -hmm. Maybe they will be ben the commuters in Nasarawa will benefit because one of those buses will be moving down to Massacre or down to Kefi or go to Niger State to get it. But these are the two states that will benefit common people from Suleja down to city center in Abuja, or coming people from Kefi down to city center in Abuja. These are the state, two states that will benefit if this 30 is deployed to FCT. I said maybe the government wants to say, let us give it around to the state. Even if we want to share it to the state, it will not go out because that's Six states will be left out. Exactly. So including FCT will be left out. So I think they should just use wisdom and give this to FCT residents to use. But the rest 2,970 buses, we need it. And that will go along with government candidate because already these 31, 30 buses they launched yesterday. A lot of Nigerians were 30 buses. For what? You know, people are saying, Agitated. punching on the government that is it what you promise after the protest. No, this is not what we want. Because part of the protest demand was CNG buses should be launched by the government. And the government have launched 30. For me, I'm expecting the rest 2,970 buses because that is when I'll see the government to be very serious on this particular issue. But it's not go the federal government alone. The state government should also take this initiative. All the money that I've been getting from the federal government, how many of them are investing in CNG buses? You know, some motor have said it can also do CNG buses for Nigeria. So let's also go there and take advantage of the facility that is there and bring out these buses for Nigeria to use. Although uh, the issue about CNG buses is a welcome one, but we also hope that the government will be able to manage the energy cost, the energy price around CNG. The buses. conversion kits for those who mm -hmm. wish to convert. Exactly. The refueling stations. Exactly. Right now, mm. Nipco, Bovas mm -hmm. are just two of the key players that exactly. have been mentioned. Mm. Uh, and it's also supposed to come with some compartments of electricity buses as well. Definitely. And vehicles. Definitely. Yeah. Because that is one of the key aspects of this CNG initiative that government is launching. Although it's quite different from the electricity electric buses that was initially 
initiated because that was the first one that was being initiated since 2014 that we're going to go into electricity buses electric buses electric cars and the rest of them but all of a sudden because of the climate issues around some of the 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 the, the byproduct of electricity issue then government has, uh, the global world now suggested that we could go for gas because gas is less uh, is more friendly to the environment and more cumbersome in terms of uh, what we normally inhale in terms of energy uh, or cost, uh, what they call it, carbon dioxide that rest of them. So it's very good for the for the air that we are breathing. So that's why many people are shifting to gas. But my concern is the pricing of gas because yesterday on the sister station we also review this energy cost, global energy cost in terms of price transmission of these gases if we don't manage it and use homegrown mechanism to control the price. Because as we speak right now, the reason why we're having issue with PMS is because crude oil is internationally priced. And the price is transmitted into a local economy and it's, and it's dollarized. Definitely. So the same thing is happening to see to gas. Because as we speak right now, people have been asking, why is it that NNLG doesn't supply local market enough of all the gas that it produces? And they'll tell you that from the argument is that it is better to sell it outside and make more dollar than sell it local. Because when you sell it local, you won't make more money as much as you make. This is a it. perfect example of mm. what happens when you have abundant resources at mm. home and yet we have to tap into the international market mm. to be able to even import crude that exactly. we need for PMS. Exactly. But coming back to gas, mm. Nigeria has abundant gas resources. Exactly. Over 30,000 cubits of gas untapped. Mm. How do we ensure that we cut down on gas flaring and be able to channel such gas in towards mm. the presidential CNG initiative. Definitely, that's what the government has started with the signing of the executive order on oil and gas so that we can exploit all our tap gas, the gas flaring issue and the rest of it. But the problem we have is that we have not been able to use local initiative technology to do that. We are still relying on foreign technology to bring that to bear. And that's why we have challenges. That's why we normally complain that we don't have the skill, we don't have the technology, we don't have the technicality. We still rely on foreign people to come and do it, expertise and the rest of them. That's why we have challenges. The, the, the concern for most of us, economists like us, critical economists like us, how can we use local knowledge to tap some of these resources? How can we initiate all the research agencies that we have that can help us to borrow and initiate that knowledge that could help us to tap this gas without relying on foreign technology now, let, to let, go a long way? Let, let's borrow a leaf from being able to borrow some set of artisanal refinery. Mm. Now in Nigeria currently, exactly. we face the issue of oil theft, mm -hmm. blamed on artisanal refineries Definitely. who do not have the licenses to be operating in the business, but have the technical know-how mm -hmm. and are somewhat thriving in their own ventures, which are illegal. Mm -hmm. How does the government of the day, knowing that this local technology, like you call it, mm -hmm. is available and can find a way to legalize the illegal? Not, not, this is what the government can do. And this is what was done in Asian countries, Asian tigers, and the rest of them. The people have the knowledge. They brought the knowledge to the bearing of government. Government research institutions took up the knowledge, begin to refine the knowledge. Over the years, we have talked about illegal refinery, illegal refinery. No government institution, research institution have come to us and say, okay, this way these guys are refining this product. Let us bring it in. Let us practicalize it. Let us see how we can make it the model more finer, more better. And environment friendly unless issue licenses no 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 don't, don't use issue license that that that, that, will, that will be will be putting a cut for the us let us bring the knowledge in a research institution like petroleum institute of nigeria two investing on petroleum institute or three of themselves that we have have they practicalized those knowledge and say, okay this knowledge that this local guy artificial and uh, 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 crude oil refinance are doing, let us practicalize it let us look at the default because one of the default is that when they finish producing they release the waste into the ground and become a problem. Okay, that's one side. Then the, the, the mechanism they are using, the boiling point and the rest of them, let's look, take a look at it and refine the boiling point. So that we get more distillate. Exactly. So those are the things that we need to suggest to government at this point. In time. Even though we are shouting, let us use our gas, let us take our gas flaring. But when we don't have the technical technology to do that, and we are still relying on foreign technology, it will cost us more. On this energy issue that we have been talking about, it is because we don't have that know-how, technology know-how, using our local knowledge to be able to fine-tune it and improve on it. That's what countries are doing. But here in Nigeria, the moment you bring that idea to them, they will know they will just see it because it will not bring money. Because bringing experts, buying technology, buying kit everywhere will make them to make money, procurement and the rest of them. Like even this kit for the CNG, there's a particular agency of government that says we can also produce the kit. 
I don't know how much, although they have established a, a kit center or what they call the uh, assembly center here in Abuja city center, but how much of those products are they producing by themselves? Big questions here. Now, whilst Mr. Adefo Larin commending President Bola Metinibu's initiative with the commissioning of 30 CNG hybrid buses in Nigeria yesterday has applauded the president, he has, however, urged the government of the day to look into tapping local technology so that we can have gas in Nigeria at affordable local prices so we do not borrow from the situation where our crude oil prices are pegged in dollars. Now, yesterday, President Bola Metinibu while speaking at the commissioning, highlighted the need for prosperity in line with our abundant gas resources. Let's take a listen to some highlights following the commissioning of the 30 C engine buses in Abuja yesterday by President Tinibu. It is a great inspiration for me to receive these buses on behalf of the government by making a significant innovation to the transportation system. Utilizing natural gas to power our transportation in industry is the next way to go. If we can enhance our energy competitiveness and bring about transformative changes like this, we would definitely, definitely be able to achieve, to achieve the prosperity that we are working hard to accomplish for our people. As has been promised by Mr. President uh, since last year, uh, a transition from fossil fuels to renewables, um, in this case uh, the CNG uh, initiative. Uh, what we have just seen today is a fulfillment uh, of sort of the President's uh, a promise that uh, Nigeria is going to uh, move gradually uh, away from very expensive uh, PMS to uh, the CNG that is really very cheap and very affordable to, us, uh, to most Nigerians. Uh, what this means is that uh, Nigerians are going to be saving money. The environment is also going to be cleaner because I mean, fossil fuels are usually uh, uh, you know, less environmentally friendly. Uh, the CNG initiative is one that is designed to first save money for Nigerians and secondly also uh, make the environment uh, cleaner uh, and uh, more habitable for all of us. At least every state you go to in Nigeria, you should be able to see these CNG buses. And that's what is so important, that there are CNG buses and you are supposed to um, bring down the cost of transportation. As we heard the president say that 80% um, of fuel is being spent on commercial vehicles and we're hoping that this one will, uh, to a large extent, enhance our strength to prosperity in Nigeria. Now, a recurrent decimal has been the catchphrase, national prosperity. Now, much in keeping with these promises, mm -hmm. do you think that this is one of those key policy mm -hmm. statements of the current administration that should it be actualized to the latter? Mm. would bring about the much-needed economic prosperity in the nation. Definitely, transport economy is very vital to any government policy trust when it wants to make sure that the economy grew. The economy has an inclusivity pattern whereby you can take the bottom of the poor out of poverty and also empower people because transport cost in Nigeria has taken a dip into many families or household microeconomy, you know, in a, a benchmark. So in this regard, the government is very, very serious in terms of the transport economy policy. You should be able to make sure that this doesn't just become a, a rhetoric that uh, it will come from the ruling class, from the government, and just end in the middle. But rather, it will be something that will go deep. For, for, for someone like me, we also have a deep understanding about our, our ban and river economy. What we are trying to say is that what we are going to suggest to government at this point is that whatever policy we are taking in the, in the transport sector, ensure that it does not just become an urban thing or a suburban thing. Let it go down to the river area. Because transportation costs 
as we speak right now in Nigeria, is so deep to the point that many people are, that is the major driver of some of the pattern of high cost of food in Nigeria. So government must be able to take that policy, not just at the top, but take it to the bottom. Then the necessity in terms of the economic growth that the government is trying to achieve will come when the bottom of the ladder enjoys some of this policy of the government, particularly this year. That's why I'm making emphasis that this 30 will go nowhere. The promise is 3,000. So where is the 2,970? Because as Nigerians will be glaring, looking at the uh, newspaper headline, looking at watching us as we are talking about this issue, and they hear 30 buses. They'll be imagine 30 from what? You promised 3,000. So where is the 2,970? And that will go a long way. And by the time 3,000 buses of CNG is available, the governors also take it up in their own initiative and bring their own. And we have close to 6,000, 7,000 buses all across Nigeria, although not enough, with other private cars also joining. It will go a long way. And the prosperity that the government is talking about through transport economy that will manifest and drive the economy to a greater level, then that will become a reality. Now, the reality, in the words of Mr. Olami Lekon Adifolarin this morning, is that transportation is the nerve wire of commerce. And should this presidential compressed natural gas initiative look to bring Nigeria's prosperity, it needs to transcend the urban areas and go down to the grassroots, where some of the vast abundant food resources we need comes from and the implication of an increased transport cost also further affects the pockets of Nigerian households. Now beyond speaking on the CNG initiative yesterday, also captured as a frontline issue this morning is part of President Bola Metinibu's restatement of a commitment to opening up digital pathways to economic prosperity for Nigerian youths. Yesterday, the international community, much like Nigeria, commemorated the International Youth Day. This morning, we earlier saw a focus on the Matrix newspaper that President Bola Metinibu has rededicated his commitment to the economic prosperity of Nigerian youths through digital economy. Mm -hmm. Now, it's coming at a time when the digital space has mm -hmm. had several concerns. Mm -hmm. Nigerian youths have been somewhat offended mm -hmm. by a call for censorship mm -hmm. in terms of regulating the social media space. Definitely. But that is just one aspect of what the digital economy entails. Yeah, exactly, exactly. On the financial side, mm -hmm. the government has had issues mm -hmm. with accepting blockchain technology. Definitely. They have taken some blockchain experts to mm -hmm. court over mm -hmm. their involvement in mm -hmm. alleged terrorism. Exactly. Do you think at this point in time, mm -hmm. our upper legislative chambers need to begin to think of a digital rights act for Nigerian youths, mm -hmm. one that empowers them to enjoy the monetization of several platforms mm. and on the other hand also helps our fintech space mm. to be able to embrace emerging and new technologies in terms of blockchain and bitcoin exactly that does not be missing in nigeria legislative all the reform that you are seeing in the digital economy space has given opportunity for that the challenge that we're having is that both the practitioners both the government have not yet find a convergence of interest where your your, your ability to use this space in terms of generating income, generating productivity, and engaging in illegal activities where it, it stops. And that is where we are having challenges. Digital economy, digital economy is very, very loud. It is one of those uh, 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 outstanding sector in the economy. If we talk about subsector in ICT, digital economy is just a subsector in the ICT. The ICT includes information, communication technology, include the media, include the entertainment, include the music, include publication. That all, they are all encompassing digital economy. But the challenge that we are facing in this country, particularly for the majority of our practitioners of digital economy space, is that they are just looking at the where aspect of just where they can double money. You get it? If I'm t when I'm, t I'm talking around from the angle of where we can exchange virtual money for physical money. And this is where the government had issue with blockchain technology. Great people will get some few dollars, change into some few coins, then begin to space virtual. Uh, it's got to begin to transact virtually, and when it comes back in dollar, they convert it to naira. And government was like, no, that is not what they are expecting the digital economy to be like. The digital economy to supposed to be productive with items and value adding, but not just transaction in financial. Uh, uh, issues trading alone. on such trading. Platform. No, that's not what retail economy only en en entails, or just buying and selling. What about the product that we are buying? Who is producing it? Where is it being produced for? Those are the issues, and that's why when economists like us are talking about the digital economy, the economy is not benefiting anything. It is only giving creating jobs and 
uh, uh, value outside the country because most of the things that are being done on those data economy are not owned by Nigerians. We are just servicing or we are providing service. Meanwhile, the real core people benefiting are the owners of those digital space, the real owners, the metas, the, the, the you, you, I hope you get it, the owners of those people. We, we are just getting on on those part platform and conducting services and but it doesn't when, benefit our local economy as much. In the deep, the way it is benefited. That's why I've been mentioned that, what about the technology behind this digital economy? Who owns it? Who controls the, the, the digital economy per se? No, when I'm talking about control as well. Yes, now when they shut down those space, what happened? Just last week, Google had issues. I was on Google doing some research, and the entire space was like, you can't even access any information. And I was like, but well, we have people saying they are the owner of digital economy. Where is the, the, the who is controlling this place? And we're also and domesticating it. Yes. We've also seen the FCCPC's mm. position mm. on WhatsApp. Exactly. And they now threaten to pull WhatsApp out of Nigeria following a fine imposed on them. Definitely. With issues of privacy. Mm -hmm. How come we have countries as strong as the UK where the likes of Mark Zuckerberg can be someone over Definitely. privacy issues mm -hmm. and he will feel the need to answer without threatening to pull out of the UK. Definitely because they know that the year there is no there is no that strong will that could hold them accountable. Because and the problem is not because the government cannot do it. The problem is we have a lot of people who are working for those uh, digital platform are representatives in Nigeria. The other time when is it uh, was the uh, was was this a uh, one that belongs to that was in Lagos shut down and lay off some staff and the rest of them. A lot of Nigerians think that they have left. They have not left. They are still available because their, their platform is still being operated in Nigeria. You get it? So the key issue is that if government of Nigeria on its own does not have its own control of its own digital platform, then we now rely on third party providing those platforms for us. Then our people now engage in them. By the time they crash or something happen, who will be the loser? The MMM issue is still much available, although it was on that, on that platform. You get it. So what I'm trying to point out is that in as much as we want to embrace digital economy, we should have our own. Why is it that in China, the, the government of China can call the bluff of any digital platform owner because they already have their own that their people can rely on. So if we don't have that, we rely on that people, there's no way we can get a big benefit. So, so this is more like a charge to the Nigerian government and the Nigerian used to be innovative and definitely, come up with our own. Definitely, because what we are doing so far, like people say, come and learn how to, uh, uh, to trade. Build, tra trade, come and learn how to build website, come and learn how to do, the, where do you finish all those things, where do you put it? You put it on that platform. So what has been going on across the world, I like mentioning the Asia Time Gas and the Asia Cup because they have learned that to be self reliance from all this technology that we are seeing, have your own. Have the one that is quite domestic that belongs to you, even though you may not have a lot of people on it. For example, when uh, CBN brought out the issue of uh, eNaira, it was a genuine way of also having a blockchain technology that is Nigeria and belongs to Nigeria. So that in case we have issues, we can rely on that one. And that's all, all over the world. You see that when you, it is good to copy, but when you copy, make sure that you copy and domesticate what you are copying in your own country so that you can, you can, it can stand for you as alternative. It's not just relying on foreign technology that we have been. And for me, the digital economy that government is shouting all every day is to train people on keyboard, how to press the keyboard, how to do your... That's what they are doing. The real knowledge, how to be creative in itself, is not there. Now, yesterday we saw much conversations mm. on the theme for the 2024 IYD, which is from clicks to progress. Mm -hmm. Youth Digital Pathways for Sustainable Development. Exactly. And I understand that you are more of an advocate for that sustainable development mm -hmm. for the Nigerian youth. Mm -hmm. Now, the minister the other day, Bosun mm -hmm. Tijani, Tijani, lamented the destruction of an investment of government mm -hmm. in Kano during the hashtag end bad governance protest. Exactly. Where an ICT hub, mm -hmm. one would think even if it's tra training them from that clicks to progress first, mm -hmm. was destroyed by youths who many Nigerians felt did not see the use, that's why they invaded the space. Hmm. How, how do we create a culture amongst Nigerian youths first to much like embrace this digital economy in terms of the knowledge first before exactly. we now begin to spur creativity? Definitely, the, the, not that Nigerian youth are now embracing the, the digital economy stuff. They are. That's why everybody is now with Android. But people will say those who destroyed those properties are still Nigerian those youths. Those ones are rioting and rampaging groups. They knew the value of those computers, that's why they stole it. They knew the value of those fridge those chairs that's why they took it just for their personal aggrandizement that's why they took it you get it so that by the time they sell it they can use it to eat or do whatever but the key question nigerian youth already have the knowledge of the importance of this 
digital economy stuff. But the issue is that how are we going to sustain it beyond relying? See, the problem most African countries are having is that our economy depends on the survival of the people giving us the, the, the knowledge and the way out of what we are engaging ourselves in. The PMS, petroleum, uh, oil and gas sector, has opened the eyes of intellectuals like us that we can't continue to rely on foreign technology. That's why Asian, I'm making reference to Asian because they have learned. You know, none of those Asian countries that we, are talk, we know today can say, okay, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, it was Microsoft that was trying to make reference to that as a, a Microsoft Development Center in Lagos, in Lagos. that shut down the other, day, the, the other time. They have already done something similar that is homegrown. That in case of in cases, in case they want to isolate us, we can call our people and say, This is our own. It's also good. Why is it that in China, uh, uh, their Facebook and the rest of them is domesticated in local languages and the rest of them? Because they have been able to learn that one day, one day, these people may want to isolate us and may to cause problems for us. Like the UK that you mentioned that they can cause the government to come and answer some questions. Meanwhile, here in Nigeria, they were just fined 220 million US dollars. They are making us, they say they are going to pull out on Nigeria. If there is an alternative for Nigeria in terms of what's up, if they pull out, would anybody even call them back? They will go. Who will lose? They will lose because Nigeria is still the biggest market in terms of the numbers of people that are clicking and pressing the keyboard. A report just came out about three weeks ago about the numbers of people that have been, in, I mean, uh, uh, that have been on the internet for many, many years. Nigeria is still, is still lead, followed by Egypt and South Africa. So, they will be the one that will lose. So, what I'm trying to point out, I'm trying to paint in as much as government is taking this initiative of the digital economy, we should be thinking of not just training people to press keyboard. Because the, 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 the objective of this uh, digital economy, there's one, the eye dies. Because I go to that document, and say that the objective is just to train people and to export them. But after exporting them, what about the deep-rooted knowledge of creating that infrastructure in Nigeria for us to use? Because the key question is that in the ICT world, if you don't have that infrastructure that is grown by you, built by you, one day this guy will continue to control you. And the much of the revenue that's supposed to come to you as a country, as a nation, it goes to them. Why do you think that Nigeria wants to launch into the space? Because most of the space and infrastructure that we have across Africa is owned by the developed world. And when Nigeria did their own, Although Nigeria won't focus on agricultural mapping. And we are saying, no, let us go beyond agricultural ma mapping or, or mapping land. Let us go to the one that can also help us in security wise and otherwise. And that's why Nigeria is still looking at that. I would just hope that the, the agency involved will continue to put that before the government and we can have our own satellite. And also, this a digital economy will not just be a service oriented consuming nation because we have been made to be consuming all these products. Then, when are we going to do our own product? That will be consumed by us and consumed by others. Now, big questions this morning as President Bola Metinibu restates his dedication to ensuring that Nigerian youths have digital economy prosperity off the back of the International Youth Day 2024. Now, whilst Mr. Adefolarin has called for more ingenious solutions to better the plots and the lights of Nigerian youths, many would recall that in a quest for integration, the National Youth Service Program was inaugurated in Nigeria and over the years it has been one of the first employers to expose graduates of tertiary institution learning in Nigeria into the labor market with prospects and even inclusions of the Said program to ensure skill acquisition. This morning let's revisit the front page of the leadership newspaper where some concerns have arisen following some policy changes that is now being projected to affect the participation of HND participants. And it's also coming in a time when the University of Calabar has had over 101 students between the period of 2021 to 2023 had their NY certificates invalidated following some forgery and false enrollments. Now let's pick up the leadership newspaper as we remind our viewers this morning of our next line of conversation. Now, not the front page of the leadership. The lead story reads, National Youth Service Policy Change Threatens HND Graduates' Participation. Polytechnics Flout Rules Admit Students Without IT Confirmation. Mm. Intervene, stakeholders beg NYSE. I I'll take that again. National Youth Service Policy Change Threatens HND Graduates' Participation. Polytechnics Flout rules admit students without IT confirmation. Intervene, 
stakeholders beg NYC. We'll, mm. we'll come to the UCAL situation yeah, first. Exactly. But, but let's let's deal with this. Mm. Because many a times people talk about this as being some of the issues why graduates mm. or prospective students even mm. prefer universities and neglect polytechnics mm. because of such policy changes that affect entry moods, mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. of institution. Exactly. Now, do you think that this is one of such Definitely, not it, treated would affect perspectives going it, it, it will, but we just hope that uh, the policymakers will review this policy thoroughly. You know, in the polytechnic system of education, what would it mean? They say two years, two years, ND two years, and HND two years. Then in between your first two years to the second two years of HND, you have to go for IT. And IT is about six months, or depending on how they program it for you. Although university students also go for IT, but their own is three months. And it's not all courses in the university that go for IT, just a few of them, mostly science courses. But the polytechnic is because of the, the, the challenges that some students have been faced, particularly students that are changing from one polytechnic to the other. You know, if you go to a particular polytechnic for your ND and you finish your HND also there, it may be easy for them to check for your IT programs, whether you are going for it, because the, the university would, and the polytechnic will definitely give you all the book work, or what they call the handbook for your IT, and you go there, you'll be coming with it. And one thing about this IT is that you have been paid. Government will pay you after engaging in that IT program. But the challenge remains that because of the nature of some people moving from one polytechnic to another polytechnic for the HND programs, and again, part time studies as well as a, a sandwiches program in HND that also comes in to the point that the people now go for part time studies in HND. But those ones may not necessarily require you to tender your, your, your IT paper for them to view as part of your admission requirement. So it's very key that Polytechnic need to also review the admission processes because if IT program done by student is also a requirement for you to get admission for HND, they should take it very strictly and very serious. But because it has not been taken very serious in the last, let's say, one decade, this is why you're having this challenge. Before, nobody talk about uh, people are not going for IT. But recently it has been discovered that people are not going for IT because the IT record I've shown that a lot of students who pass through the HND program don't go for IT. But we need to just rework the program of IT and also situate in a way that people can be more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it can be easy for people to go for it and don't make it very difficult for them to go for it. Let's also talk about the culture in mm. the industrial training participants. Mm. I have, I've had the pleasure of tutoring a few. Mm. But you find that that somehow there's a culture of absenteeism. Definitely. A lot of IT students come in I don't know if it's because of the gap in mm. knowledge, mm. but they feel overwhelmed in some of their IT attachment areas. Definitely. And they, there's the attempt, absenteeism of just sign my log, sir, mm -hmm. without really going through the rigors of the training to acquire the knowledge they were sent for there in IT. In the first you place. may not blame the student, you blame the society. Because the society allowed that, that vacuum to come in. Come in the sense that we are not taking it very seriously. That, okay, when students come for IT, I, I, apart from uh, the, the, for, for those of us that are in the media, that see IT students coming to come and learn some part of the rigorous activities about the mass communication, some practically. Uh, other field, I don't know how they are doing because in the media, I know that I've seen some IT students coming and have also participated in some of the orientation. But other field, I don't know much what they are doing. But the key issue is that if society allowed this vacuum to come in, definitely it will, it will spread and it will become a monster. So it has become a monster in the polytechnic education that people don't go for IT. They just go straight for their HND admission and they give them and they work straight for NYC and they are they are serving. You get it. But for investors, it's not all courses in university that you go for IT. Just specific of them that go for IT. We can take that as an excuse. But for the political that is mandatory that they should go for it. Because some people stop at ND, they don't go further. And that's why that IT industrial training is very, very important for them. But we also need to remind students and encourage them if you're a political student, you need to go for this particular program because it also enhance your knowledge practically if you are waiting for nyc program to come and enhance your program your knowledge it will, you may not get it because when people go for nyc some of them don't you, the, the, your primary area of assignment they may not give you the still necessary that culture of absenteeism absenteeism there. but you may not have the necessary opportunity to learn because most coppers sometimes they put them in department where they will be going to buy a recharge card for people or going to be going on errand or maybe except in an organization that really need workers to work or they are lacking staff. If you go and serve in local government, for example, not you won't do anything. If you go and serve in some government institution, you will not do anything as a, it's only in the private sector you can see that NYC there's high level of productivity. Productivity they engage you seriously. But for the polytechnic student, what we just need to do is let us encourage them. 
is not to put any blame on anybody, particularly putting the blame on NYC that or any NYC want to enrich on people. No, it is part and parcel of the act that establish HND programs in Nigeria as well as to take education. Like that they must, they must go to IT. So what we just need to go do is to go back and review some of this policy and conscientize the students that you need this particular program and they should be told that they are going to be paid because some of them I see. 20,000 or 10,000 they are being paid as nothing. Now, now, let me not take you too far away of some mm. of the relevance of this NYC certificate mm. and the level of punishment that can be meted for forgery. Mm. Recall a minister mm. in the past administration, I don't mm. want to talk about the administration, but a minister of finance, mm. high ranking, mm. who owing to issues on NYC certificates. Exactly was removed from office. Mm -hmm. Now, yesterday I was listening to the Director of Public Information in the NYSC, Mr. Eddie Megwa, mm -hmm. where he talked about 110 students mm -hmm. between 2021, 2022, and 2023 that had their certificates invalidated following mm -hmm. a falsification of their recruitment process mm -hmm. through the University of Calabar. Mm -hmm. Now, Nigerian students are becoming more hungry to obtain NYSC certificates by hook or crook. Definitely. I, and you talked about these requirements in terms of job opportunities, mm -hmm. appointments into office, exactly. or even vying for elective offices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, do you think that somewhat societal cultures in terms of maintaining integrities of a program as brilliant as the NYC mm. have been eroded mm. following the pressure to obtain it by hook or crook? I think what we need to do is to first educate the Nigerian student, particularly those that are going for NYC. There are three certificates that will be issued. One is the main certificate that you get. There's exemption certificate and there's also uh, the, the third one is for people who may have uh, challenges because of uh, health-wise, they may not be able to attend. The those ones that get the exemption certificate are those who are maybe age-wise. They were exempted as a result of age. Then the third mode of entry. Definitely, mode of entry. Then the third certificate is those people that maybe as a result of their health challenges, they cannot do it. There's a name they call that particular uh, certificate. Now, for me, NYC need to take this education very, very serious. To the higher institution. Higher institution. Including general public, because the same these three certificates mean the same thing. If you present it for any job, it is the same thing as if a certificate it, of service. Exactly, it doesn't discourage. If you have an exemption certificate, it doesn't mean that you are the person that have the main certificate is more more enlightened, more educated than you. No, it doesn't mean anything. Or if you have the certificate, it doesn't mean the top certificate that I could not record the name now. You have no. It is the same thing. Like people that go for uh, what they call this national open university, that they, they want to also have. NYC certificate, they want to go to. By the time government approve it for them, it is exemption they will be getting. You get it? They'll be getting that exemption. And it also qualified them for the same uh, uh, whatever uh, 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 goodies who own the main certificate collect. It's the same thing. So NYC on its part need to do education. When President Tunu was uh, talking to Nigerians last week about the protests at the rest of the he said Nigerians have been misformed and miseducated. And I pinpoint that particular thing, I said, no, Mr. President, Nigeria was misinformed and miseducated because the government refused to educate and inform Nigerians. The same thing is happening to NYC. If NYC is discovering that people are forging their certificate, it is because you are not educating Nigerians on the importance and significance of these three certificates they normally issue out. Tell them it is the same thing. There's no difference between you that wear the khaki. A discharge certificate, certificate and an exemption certificate. It is the same thing. It qualifies you for everything. If I'm going to look for a job, I, I have your main certificate of NYC and someone that has a general certificate. If I, with the same qualification, present your NYC certificate. The same thing. You either present exemption or you or present, present discharge. You are qualifying for the job. Except maybe for other criteria that the owners of you want to give the job are looking at. But when it comes to the NYC certificate, the three of them, they are the same thing. So NYC need to educate Nigerians. The public relations officer, they are all outlets in their public unit, uh, education department. They need to begin to educate Nigerians. This is it. They should be even begin to bring out a newspaper. I mean, write up on this particular issue or raise consciousness of Nigerians about these three certificates. Because what Nigerians are thinking, especially the youth who are less than 30 years, is that no, if you have this particular certificate and the other person has a certificate, you are more, you qualified are more qualified for the job than the other one. <laughs> so they need to educate Nigerians. If they educate Nigerians, many will just relax. Some youth will not even bother. And again, we know the Alawi thing is also another and the motivation. That, yeah. That is making people to say, okay, I want to have this, I want to. But the people that forge their own, do they get the Alawi? They didn't get the Alawi. They didn't get it. They only forge it as a result of the discrepancy that may come in or the lack of understanding that may come in because they said, if you have the main certificate and you don't have the other one, if you present it, you will easily get a job 
faster than the person that presents the election. Like, it's a lie. It's the same thing. The law that created this particular certificate threw all of them on the same level to mean the same thing at the same time. Well, this is an information that uh, Mr. Adefo Larin feels that if shared with Nigerian youths and tertiary institutions, it might have prevented 101 graduates of the University of Calabar, Calabar from having their certificates invalidated by the NYSE following fraudulent enrollments and also with poly uh, polytechnics flouting the IT requirements for graduates, which might also affect the participation of HND graduates following a policy change in the National Youth Service Program. Now, in keeping with more developments this morning, let's turn our attention to earlier publications by The Punch and New Telegraph. On the one hand, would it need a constitutional amendment to get the local governments functioning? As we hear this morning that the federal government and state governors have reached a somewhat agreement on local government allocations. This is off the back of concerns in 1990, where some states failed to pay teachers and workers salaries. Let's pick up both of those papers as we continue the conversation this morning. Now, on the punch, you'd find the lead story. FG governors reached three months agreement on local government allocations. Government worried about 1990 era where LGs could not pay teachers, workers salaries, says officials. The New Telegraph looks at the issue from the angle of a new constitution. As Yakase cautions Tinubu over Patriot's demand for political reforms. A company headline says, Hesti move can plunge Nigeria into chaos. Joins OBJ in blaming nation's challenges on current constitution operators. Mm. Now, President Bola Metini will have done something monumental in the democracy we all clamor for. Exactly. Having sued 36 state governors to court mm. over local government allocations. Mm. Now, many are looking at the provision of the constitution in terms of joint accounts for local government and state governments. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that these allocations guarantee mm. that the mistakes of 1990 would not repeat itself, where some states are also lamenting about not meeting the 70,000 naira minimum wage. <laughs> some are even saying that these allocations are not sufficient enough to service their states to ensure that teachers and other workers receive salaries as mandated. I think in the first thing, let's all separate which set of teachers are we paying, which set of workers are we with this local government allocation. It has been explicitly, I mean, pointed out. For local government, they are handling primary school teachers. So they are paying their salaries. They are paying primary ed core workers in the various primary ed in the local government. Those are the two major, and they staff in the local government. So which other workers is local government paying? So which other amount are they giving out that will not be enough? The issue is just that for us to avoid the politics and continue to do propaganda around this local government. We know a lot of people are not happy. Particularly the political appointed individuals, the governors. That some means every governors, state you go to in Nigeria, are, you should are, be able to see this here. Around this particular one. But we must say the fact that there is no local government that will not be able to pay its worker salary, teachers, and all that, if the money goes to them directly. They will never have that challenge. But because of the incumbencies of governors who believe that when local government funds come, let us add it to the entire state money and see how we can distribute it. That's what is happening. But we don't want that to continue. And for the three months that the federal government have under uh, understanding with the state governor, if for the state governor that from this that period that that judgment was given, to October, all states must conduct local government election. Then after then, any state that refused to conduct local government election, their fund will not be given to, to the local government. That's what the agreement. And that's why most states are now putting... So that we don't effort. have caretaker committees anymore. Exactly. And that's why most states are putting effort to quickly conduct their election at local government level. But when it comes to the fund, if the local government is receiving 100 million, 100 million will take care of everything that the state local government wants to do. You get it? I mean, except maybe that local government went and borrowed money. So another thing we need to begin to... Uh, I mean, uh, current local government practitioner or local government chairman is that, please, as this law has been passed, as this judgment has been passed, this constitutional review is coming for you to enjoy this fund. Please don't mortgage your local government because the problem with our political elected individuals, the moment they enter a political position, the first thing is to collect loan. And when they collect loan, they mortgage the funding that will be coming from either from federal or from state to the, to the loan. And once the loan comes, they take out the banks, take whatever they are, they, is meant for them, and they give them the rest. That's why most of them don't have money. So we must begin to sing it as a song in the heirs of all local government chairman that please once you start collecting your phone don't go and be collecting loans because it is a practice 
Why do you think that uh, Governor uh, Makinde of uh, Yosti is very, very angry with the local government autonomy? Because he has mortgaged the entire territory local government to loan. He has borrowed money. So the money that's supposed to be coming to the to the, to the state account is now used for debt services. For debt services. And now that he, there is a new initiative, it will be it will be forced to use the entire state revenue to be paying those loans. And whatever money that is coming, it will just be diverted to the loan. And that's why he's angry. So but for now, let us engage the local government that please so as this money is coming, don't go and collect loan. Don't allow any bank to come and <laughs> entice you because the banks or the financial institutions are also very, very quick. They will quick uh, approach a, a chairman local government. Uh, don't worry, we can offer you these facilities. You can it's a long term. Don't worry if your tenure end, your incoming person will come. Those are the sweet things they'll go and tell them. Before you know, they'll be indebted in depth into that. So we must say it. As it is. And that should be one of the advocates we should meet to say, do in right now. Local government chairman, as you are coming, as the money, please don't allow any bank or any financial institution to sweet talk you into collecting loan. Because once you do that, the interest, the principal, you will not be able to pay. Meanwhile, the local government will be suffering. Now, now, Mr. Defo Larin, from an economic perspective, is also advocating this morning in terms of local government allocations and the way local government chairmen, as duly elected, expend these funds. He has also looked at it from the angle of being indebted through borrowing. This is also one of the prominent issues of concerns in the news this morning. Like we talked about earlier, issues of Nigeria's current food crisis have been also blamed on the Anko Boras program. In terms of the deficiency in repayment as well and in the implementation of the policy now experts earlier on the show this morning looked at it on the front page of the nigerian tribune on the tribune beneath the masthead earlier you saw the story how nigeria walked into food crisis by experts identifying security as major disincentive to farmers blame uncle borrow's program insincerity of state government's investments lack of subsidy on fertilizers say elites conspired killed OBJ, Jonathan's cassava initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, predating the Angkor Boras program for rice and mm -hmm. addition to the rice value chain exactly. is also this cassava initiative. Now, we look at three issues that have been named as disincentive to farmers. Mm -hmm. There's a blame on the Angkor Boras program, much mm -hmm. like you blame borrowing. Exactly. There's a blame on insincerity of state governors' mm -hmm. investments. Mm -hmm. There's a blame of lack of subsidy on fertilizers. Definitely. Now, once we have these blames, I want us to pick it from this current administration's efforts to addressing the issue. First, there was a declaration on the state of food security in Nigeria by President Bola meeting. Very well. Now, there have been subsistent efforts in disbursing fertilizers to farmers, mm -hmm. but yet again, the state governors are culprit in this issue. A lot of them are blaming them <laughs> for the laxity in disbursing this to farmers, saying the raining seasons, the wet seasons is well into its peak, and some states are yet to receive this disbursed fertilizer. Mm. So how do you adjudge these blames being thrown on? the efforts to remedify the situation. Uh, these are the problems we have been faced for many, many years, particularly with the modest history of Nigeria since 1999 in terms of our democracy, 25 years. This is the same challenge that we are really at. The ruling class, they are, they are pinching to always make policy of government to some assault. The, the, the expert, the, the, the also the, the business community, the private sector, including individuals. Now, the issue is because when government initiate policy, the policy comes in two ways. It has a positive side, it has a negative side. For instance, this CNG buses that the, the president initiated is going to dislodge something. It's going to dislodge people selling petroleum products. Even the entire Nigeria will do what? Embrace CNG buses, including private cars. Embrace. What will happen to people selling PMS petroleum? I mean, filling station everywhere. It will dislodge them. So you won't see, expect them to sit and be watching. They will also want to do what? Fight back. Now, they made mention of the cassava bread, cassava bread issue. It was the flour producers in Nigeria and master bakers that went all sludge to ensure that that policy never worked. You get it? They came out with all manner of propaganda, including health issues. That like if you are eating too much cassava, you are prone to <laughs> some disease. And everybody was, eh? You mean eating too much bread cassava because especially from the Gary angle. If Gangu, you, if, if you that you be too much Gary without some sort of you, you be running eye problem. eye problems. So they came up with all my, so people were discouraged. And government spent billions of naira on that particular project. It ends that way. The same thing with other see, the thing is that anytime government brings out a policy and if the policy comes out to dislodge its opponent. The opponent will do everything possible to ensure that that policy will never survive. And that's why we have advised that when government is initiating policy, this is the thing we have suggested on several occasions. When government is initiating policy, 
be the first consumer of that policy. They just throw it out to the public. When they did the cassava thing, they throw it out to the public. Meanwhile, the government themselves refused to, to consume the bread. Then if the government have initiated breaking across Nigeria and begin to produce bread and go to other area be selling bread, do you think Nigerians will still be relying on wheat for flour to be producing flour? By the time we have gone far, our cassava will be, be modernized. All those shortcomings, all those faults, those health experts that were being paid to, to, to bring down that policy would have also discovered that, ah, no, this uh, is not like that, it's like this. Because improvements would have done. When I was talking about the oil and gas sector refinery issue and said that we have artificial uh, refinery, we call it legal refinery, if we have worked on that part since 2005, that notice that we have artificial uh, refineries or illegal refinery operating in Nigeria data, by now we would have improved on those refinery, we would have, have a modern refinery, homegrown technology that would have become our own. And that's what happened to government policy. So we initiate policy and the government itself refused to buy into it or engage in it. It become a challenge. Now, this inability to ensure government participation has mm. been largely premised on what the Nigerian Tribune this morning calls insincerity on the part of state governments mm. in investment mm. in agriculture. Mm. Uh, it's more of an issue, especially from the fact that most of the capital cities in states mm. are not agrarian. Yeah, this is domiciled in the local governments. Mm -hmm. So how do we incorporate the sincerity of government from the third tier of governments where the fields to be cultivated up. No, no, the, 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 there's nothing wrong. I've said this on this platform before. There's nothing wrong in the city center of Abuja to have a farm hub. No. Or a farm garden. Like the one the president's wife is promoting. That the back of your house you can plant garden. There's nothing wrong. When we had this show with high cost of pepper, onions, tomato, we suggested that we can have, instead of giving land to everybody to be building estate that we are building for lizards and cockroaches and that people are not willing to occupy because of the expensive nature of those houses. We can give some plots, some thousands of hectares within the cities that are called the garden, where we can be produce some of this to cater for the need of some of those essential things. There's nothing wrong that in a, city, uh, a state capital to have farm settlement within state capital. There's nothing wrong. It's okay to, because one of the things that made food items to be very expensive because of the transportation cost. So when you now have a farm within the city, cent or city centers or within the state capitals that are very close to the people, to the urban centers area, it reduces the cost of transportation of those things. I think one person who agrees with you is the first lady, Senator. That's why right, she's she practicing the garden. There's from, a garden in the, in in the, the villa. villa. So everybody should also do that. But the thing is that when government brings those policy, you should be the first consumer of those policy, not throwing it out to the public. Because most times we throw the policy out to the And that's why these Ayanas and Parasite look at the policy, devote it, and bring it down. From an opposition, opposition angle. angle. Not just opposition angle, not political opposition angle. From economic angle. People feel that our business is not being threatened. CNG is going to threaten the oil, uh, the, the oil sector. Oil stations. Oil stations. So, we government need to pass. Uh, this is not by asking uh, Bovas. Come on, uh, sorry for mentioning Bovas, because one of the leading no. athletes that will be. Of course, Bovas and NIPCO are, are key yeah. stakeholders now, in this. NIPCO is the government owned. Fine. We should also have more government interest in this. The outlet that will be built should be owned by government, not private. Because what, what I'm trying to point out is that in experience I've taught us that when government release the policy, like the Uncle Bova policy that government asked me, when government give everybody money to go and farm, which farm did the government did? Which farm did the CBN have for itself? Nothing. CBN should have participated as Definitely. part of the key stakeholders to also have their own farm. Own farm so they can get, even if it is to be selling to your staff alone. It will cater, it will go a long way, but just throw it to the public and say, okay, everybody, no. The thing is that it, that policy threatening is another policy that has been existing for some time. And that's why we are saying that this CNG bosses is a good one for us to tap into an energy uh, project. But the issue is that if we don't know how to bring a technology that will be homegrown to it, there's no way we can reduce the price. Because the moment the price of gas goes up, cooking gas, for example, from October to December, the higher price of cooking gas will go up. You know why? It is winter in developed climes. It's very cold. So they want to store gas. So they buy it enough. Don't be surprised by the time we get to December. To, to December, the when CNG is now circulated in Nigeria, they will now be telling you that and CNG that's very cheap before, that you can save 70% 70, 70 of the cost that you spend on PMS or petroleum on CNG, or the 40% that you can save from your own pocket as not spending too much on on. On, 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 the, on energy, you're not saving to yourself. You're not be able to get because the price of gas is now being internationally priced. You're not be wondering how the government push us into this. We now go back to the same circle of what we have been facing in the petroleum sector. Well, interesting conversations this morning on our flagship program. Critical issues 
of urgent concerns. We invite you to also share your thoughts, comments, and opinion on these issues as captured as headline stories on our newspaper review. But before we return to the conversation, let's take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Well, thanks for staying with us on our newspaper review segment. There are more issues in the news, some pressing and some quite dramatic. Now, before we get into the viral video that had Nigerian social media space agog, the Nigerian Immigration Service has also issued a press release concerning the incidents involving a couple where the wife mutilated her husband's international passport at the point of departure where they were about leaving Nigeria. Now, this has been one of the most dramatic events to start the new week with. But before we get into that, let's leave the airspace and talk about Nigeria's maritime space. Now, the, the Massa DG has also issued a statement of some of the sabotage by the international community that is impeding Nigeria's trade. This was earlier captured on the Nigerian News Direct. Now, on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct, much earlier in our discussion, the lead story talked about comments from the Damasa DG. It says how $400 million annual insurance on ships impedes Nigeria's trade. Now, beneath that, it says alleges sabotage by economic and international committee. Now, this comments from the Numasa DG is very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, one would think, how did insurance become so much of a burden on mm -hmm. Nigeria's trade? Mm -hmm. And in looking at the allegations on the international cartel, mm -hmm. much like Dangote, this is the third person that is looking at the international community as a cartel <laughs> frustrating Nigeria's trade. You know, we are not surprised that uh, people, expert actors, are coming out to say this against international communities. But we should also be reminded that international community also have a way of benefiting the Nigerian economy. We are an import-dependent economy. So one way or the other, we are benefiting from international competitiveness in terms of economy and the rest of them across the world. So if we now pinpoint the aspect that is now a disadvantage to us, meaning that we should also let Nigerians know the aspect that has been very, very advantageous to us. Now, the issue of the ship is around international transportation in terms of how ships travel across the world, how they are protected in terms of the goods they carry. So if Nigerian ships cannot pay the 400 million annual insurance, it means that they are not getting enough product or enough goods to transport out of Nigeria or to ferry out of Nigeria. That was it means. But if they are getting enough of that, it means that they can be able to pay such amount. So it now goes back to how active are Nigerian ship owners on international water. That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. How active are they? How much of the local ships, how many of them are participating on in international transportation aspect? It means whether they are transporting goods from Nigeria outside Nigeria. Does it mean that when ships come into Nigeria, it is the good, uh, ships of international standard or international company that normally take out goods out of Nigeria? So what has happened to the local ships that they also they don't participate in all these trade? Because that is what you'll be looking at. If they are not participating, there's no way they can make money. So it's not just for us to ink the blame on annual 400 million US dollar that ships need to pay for insurance. But it is for the insurance is to, 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 to cater for in case of accident and risks that may occur on the IC. And that's why that money is there. So that for me is not an excuse. But rather, how are we going to strategize the Nigerian Shipping Council? Because that is the body that government created where all ship owners meet. But the problem with all these agencies is that when government created all these agencies, people who, who call themselves stakeholders, players, only go there to go and get some of the incentive that government will be giving to those agencies. That's what they do. Meanwhile, the real actors that are supposed to be participating in this economy, they are not there. So what I'm trying to point out is that if we have goods that have been exported out of Nigeria, whose ship is still carrying those goods? Is it international ship that still come to come and pick those goods? What happened to Nigerian ship owners that say we have ship? and they are not participating in the economy. So we need to begin to ask ourselves that question. So the Nemasa boat, it may be right in the sense that that money is very huge, but it should also be noted and told that that money is to cater for the doomerang or the damages that may come as a result of accident on the ISIS. So it's not something that we should just say, okay, because they said it, we should clap hands for him. Rather, let us go back home. And still go back to this issue that I raised earlier in our discussion about homegrown economic policy. How do we support our ship owners? Are we just supporting them, giving them money, that they, they will not buy the ship or they will just make away with the money? Or we are not supporting them so that they can also take up the goods that have been exported out of Nigeria to that country? Because that's the way I see this particular issue 
we should not just focus and put the blame on international organizations because we know that we are part and parcel. Nigeria is a global economic actor. You understand? We participate in the economy globally. So whatever that is happening on the international scale, we should be very sure that we need to also participate in it. And when we are participating, there's an aspect that is benefiting us and there's an aspect that is causing problems for us. So those aspects that are causing problems, how can we arrange and repair it? It's very key to this issue that we are discussing at this point. Now, talking about some economic solutions that would help spur our uh, economic prosperities on the local fronts has also been from the angle of a concern captured on the front page of the Vanguard, where reported are 50 firms that have been forced to close shop over our current economic realities and over a thousand employees who have been thrown back into the labor markets. The Vanguard earlier reported this morning, distress as harsh economy forces shutdown of over 50 firms. 80% others in low capacity utilization, over 100,000 employees thrown into job markets. Labor begs FG to intervene. Hmm. Uh, uh, let, let's make sense of this. Hmm. Inflation is pressing at its hardest. Mm -hmm. The cost of production for some of these firms mm -hmm. have tripled. Hmm. It is only logical that this downsizing was over-anticipated. Definitely. Uh, definitely. But, but in terms of the effects on households, hmm. what's the best intervention the government can do as urged by the organized labor? Definitely, what the uh, organized labor is as intervention on the part of those companies that have been shutting down. But for me, I, I, I'm i very critical about this particular issue. When we say companies are shutting down, one, why are they shutting down? Everybody will say, okay, the economy ash policy of the government is affecting them. Then when we look at, when we thoroughly look at the economy ash policy of the government, it comes on two angles, the physical policy and the monetary policy. What is making companies to shut down? Most of them depend on the import of the materials and goods they use to produce their products, their wares, and the rest of them. Now, they rely on Forex to buy those things. Then the question you ask, how long have these companies been existing in Nigeria producing those goods and they have never looked at local products or local material, local resources that could be alternative for them to produce? They have, look, they have never looked at local technology that could be alternative to the machine and equipment they are importing. Because if you thoroughly look at some of these issues, it's not because government policy is that bad entirely. It is because some businesses don't have long-term plans. See, Asian tigers, Asian cubs that we call Asian countries, China, Japan, and the rest of them, they have learned a lot from the use of technology and how to ensure that their homegrown technology help them and assist the manufacturing sector. Government in Nigeria created over 60 research institutions. And ask me how many private institutions are engaging all the research institutions to see how they can improve some of their machines, their equipment, their spare parts, and whatever. I will still repeat this. What makes companies in Nigeria to shut down is not entirely the policy of the government, but because of failure of long-term planning. Because you want to do business and you want to exist, you, you want you just are you doing the business to just exist for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Particularly those foreign com companies that left Nigeria, they never think of long-term plan solutions to some of their machines, their equipment, their spare parts, that, okay, let us see how we can domicile or domesticate some of this equipment and see how we can use local technology to build them as alternative. They don't think of that. But the problem is that because the fiscal policy of the government in terms of taxes, the, uh, the monetary policy of the government in terms of how Forex is being released, how, what they are getting from Naira to dollar exchanges. These are the two things that affect those companies. You get it? It's just that if you begin to break them down, begin to bring them down into other factors. But the two critical things that affect business shutting down in Nigeria are from the monetary and fiscal policy. The exchange rate issues. Because most of them are importing materials and equipment. So they are not getting the exchange, they are not getting the exchange rate favorable for them. The other aspect has to do with fiscal policy of the government, particularly tax, either from the federal government or from the state government. These are the things, things that are affecting. But for us who are who, who, who are trying as much as we to see the in as much as these things are there, there are alternative measures to have been put in place to safeguard your company or business from dying. For years, we have been operating. You don't think of local technology that will enhance your product. You don't think of local materials that will enhance your product. So why won't your, your, your business fold up when you cannot meet up? And again, the forest policy of the government, we agree, is impacting. But importation of some of these things is also affecting not just your business it's affecting the entire nigeria economy because if you are looking at it from the a a, a, a linear perspective just a single line argument so okay uh, forest policy is affecting businesses but the forest policy because you are also importing you import, your independence of importation is also affecting the general welfare of the nigerian economy as well so when you now say the microeconomy of nigeria 
because the power parity of naira has fallen down as a result of what everybody is looking for dollar so what will happen to the few dollars that's available what will happen to naira now naira it will it will the power parity will fall so we should be to for me let us balance this issue let us balance this argument let us not just aim the blame on government policy because for me who have understood government policy to an extent all government policies are not that bad entirely there are good side of those policies but the problem is because the economy have so much depend on importation and the people in concern have not looked in, into the home technology to see what they can find as alternative why is it that people are not changing gear towards alternative medicine local medication local medicine producing them and getting because I that if you continue to rely on this orthodox medicine a time will come we will not have them because of forex because of government policy but let us now look at our traditional medicine and see how we can improve on it. And you can see the improvement on majority of the traditional medicine. They are not being produced in a way that it can be user-friendly and good yeah, for like the health. Refined, now. refined the yes. packaging is even better. Packaging them. So what happened to all other industries we are, that are producing for us? What stopped them from looking at local technologies? Now, now talking about other industries this morning and in keeping with more newspapers as we look to wrap up our newspaper review, the Guardian newspaper has feature stories accompanying it. Very shortly as well, owing to the prominence on The Guardian, we'll take a listen to the speech made by the Deputy Governor of Edo State, Governor Foolish Yaibu, following his reinstatement. But let's look at the front page of The Guardian together. On the front page beneath the masthead this morning, the focus is on the national broadband plan. That is indeed the catchphrase that leads the story. As the lead story reads, on The Guardian, FG may miss 2025 target as 136 million Nigerians lack internet access. National broadband plan, FG may miss 2025 target as 136 million Nigerians lack internet access. Then the demographics backing this accompanies that lead story. But then you find more stories of interest. Shuaibu resumes as Edo State's deputy governor. We'll take a listen to his comments shortly. But before we take a listen to his comments, uh, let's get your thoughts on this lead story. Hmm. We, we keep talking about betting in our digital space. Mm -hmm. And now it's alarming that we have a broadband plan that is about to be shot on its target for 2025 as 136 million Nigerians still lack internet penetration. Now, the internet penetration is even worrisome when you know that some people lack basic 2g mm -hmm, places mm -hmm. that have been promised 4g and 5g mm -hmm, do not mm -hmm. have such exactly. penetration exactly although, although although for me i i will not entirely say okay we lacked it per se but what is happening is that the, the access the affordability of those uh, infrastructure is what is causing us problem particularly data and when we talk about the people that are lacking it majority of them are found in rural areas interior part of the country that this 2G, this 4G that you mentioned have not yet penetrated. So, if most of them, most of these people in the rural area come to this, a little bit of closer area that some of these 2G, 3D uh, in connectivities are available, they get it. But what about the data? Because one of the key drivers of uh, internet penetration is availability of data, accessible of data, and affordability of data. So, if these are not available, there's no way you want to take the entire population into 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 the cognizance of having them to be to have the opportunity to be on the internet. But another thing is this, government have promised a lot of infrastructure development in this area. They have said so many things about broadband uh, in, in, infiltration to the Nigerian ecosystem of uh, communication and the rest of them. But how much of it have we been able to deliver? And again, we should also understand that it is privately driven. They are only taking their product to where they will get value for money. Not like government that is talking about, I will take connectivity to everywhere. Everywhere doesn't mean you make money from everywhere. So these guys that own the infrastructure, take their infrastructure to where they will raise money. I don't know when I, you or you'll get yes. what I'm saying. So it's not government will be talking from the angle of welfareism. The owners of those infrastructure will be talking of the way of a profit. If we mention all the telecommunication companies that we are talking about now, they are all out for profit. They are not out for charity. So when government is talking about and we are going to target one and thirty six million naira to be on internet, is it for free or is it for profit? The cost. The cost. That's why I say accessibility, affordability. And the means whereby people can have it. If you go to rural areas now, we are in the city centers in Abuja. Accessibility is there. Affordability can say yes, people can afford it. But what about the target population that government is looking also looking at the rural areas? And the reason why government is making this noise about this, this internet expenditure is because of financial inclusivity. 
so that to empower Nigeria financially and also to empower them in terms of literacy, information, dissemination, and the rest of them. Those are the angle that they are taking. But government is just making noise about an angle for the welfare package. You are not participating in it. Just like I said earlier in our discussion, if you throw a policy out and you are not participating, you don't consume it. Don't think that the entire public will accept it. Because as we speak right now, on this broadband issue, ICT issue, it is privately driven. There is no government infrastructure that is there that anybody is using. It is their own they build. So how do you expect them to go and put uh, infra infrastructure in places where they will not make money make or where it will be vandalized? It will not happen. So we just need to encourage government that it's a good target, 136 million, good one. You can even increase it to 150. But the thing is that build the infrastructure, create the enabling environment that if they are going there, they will make money. They will not make losses. That is the only way to engender and guarantee this 136 million and above what the government is targeting. Now, we have one more paper before we call it a wrap on our review of local stories this morning. Our final point of call is on the front page of the Daily News Hub. But beyond just reviewing the stories, we also have accompanying footage which we wish to share with you as the two stories of prominence guide our discussion. Now, in finality, on the front page of the Daily News Hub, you'd find us lead story beneath the master this morning, Edo Crisis or Baseki Shwaibu set for fresh showdown. As Shwaibi resumes as deputy governor, direct staff to report for duty. Obaseke kicks. Edo government accuses Shwaibu of impersonating deputy governor. Obaseke claims spurious, says Shwaibu. Now beneath that on the rider, Rivers APP secretariat bombed amid Fubara's rumored defection plan. Now before we get your thoughts, hmm. uh, let's get this footage as it concerns this development. First, Ahead of the Edo of Sekuli election and the reinstatement of the Deputy Governor, His Excellency Mr. Philip Shuaibu, let's take a listen to his comments before we also give you footage of the sad development with the bombing of the APP Secretariat in River State. Let's take the first and then we'll come to the latter. My good people of Edo State and fellow Nigerians, today I come before you to reiterate my dedication to serving the wonderful people of Edo State. My reinstatement as the Deputy Governor of Edo State is a testament to the divine grace of God Almighty and the steadfast prayer of all Nigerians, for which I am truly grateful. In recent weeks, the Federal High Court in Abuja reinstated me as the Deputy Governor of Edo State, acknowledging the illegality of the impeachment. Upon my arrival in Benin, a tragic event occurred as an assassination attempt was made on my life. Thankfully, the bullet missed its mark. Unfortunately, hit an armed policeman assigned to the APC gubernatorial candidate for the upcoming September 21st election in Edo State. Let's us take a moment to remember the following officer. May so rest in peace. I have been informed that several suspects have been apprehended, some of whom have provided crucial confessional statements. Following my return to office, I have formally requested the governor's approval for the reinstatement of my aides. However, I have yet to receive a response from him. Also, I recently communicated with the governor about my trip to the United States of America to participate in the AFEMA World Congress and to visit our athletes competing in the 2024 Olympics in Paris, France. Today, I am issuing a clear directive to all staff within the Deputy Governor's Office whom have not yet returned to work to resume forthwith. Failure to comply will result in appropriate sanctions. In line with the judgment, the office of the deputy governor was never vacant. In this regard, all transactions that will have been done in my absence remain illegal, null and void, and of no effect whatsoever. I want to make it known that any bank conducting business with the office of the deputy governor of Edo State, without my explicit approval, does so at its own risk. Nevertheless, I want to reassure my dear people of Edo State that I am back in my role 
as the Deputy Governor of Edo State, ready to perform my duties, fulfill my responsibilities, and deliver on the promises of democracy. God bless Edo State. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Edo State, mm. Mr. Philip Shuaibu, speaking following his reinstatement. Mm. Let's uh, make meaning of some of the points he, he raised. A very interesting point he raised, particularly the one of transaction. You know, I said something when we were discussing, I said, the moment someone is elected or appointed, the first thing they do, they go and collect loan from a bank. They mortgage their salaries or mortgage their location that is coming to that office for that. And he has already said that the former person that was appointed when he was not available, Definitely, it has been already been expressed through the law that whatever amount that, that has been spent on him as a deputy governor, he has to make a refund of that money back to the estate, the estate corpus. That is the one. Then two, for me, I, I see this judgment as a very landmark judgment. Thank God the Edo state governor did not went and appeal the case. It would have become a disgrace at the Supreme Court because the same thing happened in Kogi State when the deputy governor was impeached. The, the man fought all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court reinstated him. But maybe he was very advised wisely not to do that. And that's why they allowed this man to come back to the office. But going further is for them to dial the tension of political rigmarole in the state. We don't want bloodshed. A policeman has already been killed as a result of plan assassination on him. But you want that tension to dial, to come down so that, ah, yes, this guy will just be there for the next three months. Whether he has assigned him to go and commission borrow, commission road, or whatever. That one is left for them, but it should allow peace to reign in the Edo state and the campaign process to also go peacefully so that when the election comes, they elect a new governor and Edo people will have a relief from every political intimidation and harassment that have passed through them in the last one year. Now, it is calls for an advocacy of peace from Mr. Olamilekon this morning ahead of the off-circle elections in Edo state. With less than three months for voters to take to the poll, He's urging the government of the Odo state in the respective offices of the governor and his deputy to allow peace to ensue. Now, earlier reported on the Daily News Hub on the Rider is a situation that has also sparked more fears of the situation in River State following the bombing of the APP secretariat ahead of his purported defection plan by Governor Siminalai Fubara. Uh, let's bring you some of the footage of this development as we look to get Mr. Olami Lekon's thoughts on it as well. Take a listen. Now, we'll take a listen to some of the details following those visuals we have seen. That is the aftermath of the APP Secretariat, which has now been cordoned off by police following that bomb attack on its premises. In that footage, which in the course of our discussion you might see again, are some shattered glasses mm -hmm. following mm -hmm. the impact of the explosion. Exactly. exactly. I, I think for me, when the news came out that this, the governor wanted to, I uh, mean, they come to this political party, I was like, ah. Of all political parties, maybe APP is very popular in River State, or he has found. We, we need to also be very, very careful in terms of analyzing this issue because, from my own angle as a political scientist, when politician or political uh, uh, strong person is trying to decamp a political party, you look for a lesser political party that can have a full control. You ask yourself, why didn't he decamp to Abga? Why didn't he decamp to APC? Why didn't he decamp to Labour Party? For matter. APP, although party known. But what is it is still rumors, though. It is still rumor. But you can, when I listen to the to the to the comment of the chairman mm. of APP, I knew that something is fishy. Truly, it could be something that want to happen. And again, another reason, and I say, okay, maybe the governor may not decamp entirely, but the local government election that is coming, APP may have a good outing. You understand, APP is especially with those caretaker chairmen exactly. that were previously appointed. appointed by him. He may ask them to go to that party, then they use the flagship of that party to contest for local government election and they will win. Now, let's take a listen to some of the details when, when, when we have them. But you, you find members of the APP here in River States 
gathering following that uh, bombing of their premise. And it's more the trajectories in the political economic angles of what this might uh -huh. pretend exactly. ahead of possible local government elections. Mm. I'm very sure that once we'll have those track ups, we'll take a listen to some of the details of what the members had to say. But you mm. said, haven't listened to the chairman of mm -hmm. the APP, APP. River State, exactly. but I've already drawn some conclusions. Definitely, because from the from what he was saying, it's like mm. there could be an ally between the governor, not PDP, between the governor and the party. And one of the first things he made was say the governor has been doing very, very well. Opposition party don't commend governors. They don't commend... That was a red flag for you. Yes, they don't commend governors. They would rather bombard them with a criticism that say somebody that refused to do this, somebody that refused to do that, somebody that... They will bring out the criticism of that governor. But in the first statement I come up with, the governor has been very, doing very, very well. The next statement was that and there have been a rumor that the governor, the local government election is coming up and the APP is going to participate fully. And you ask yourself, of all the local government elections that have been carried out in the last six months in Nigeria, two parties have just been participating. Is it that PDP or APC? Check it. But in this case, in River State, it is not APP that want to go and contest for... <laughs> even uh, the close-by states, they didn't contest or participate in local government elections. So how come? So you will know that there's already an alliance friendship between the APP and Governor Fubara in River State. Now, and whilst Mr. Lami Likon has his reservations on what perceived alliance is brewing between the PDP and APP in River State, uh, let's take a listen to some of the following developments on the issue. It's really a sad day for democracy. We condemn it in its strongest term the act of bombing our river state chapter secretariat. It is a heinous act. It is an act of terrorism. It is a treasonable act. We are all aware of what is happening in river state. That it is all about seizing the treasury of river state. We know this is not the first time this act of terrorism is happening. We have had incidents of bombing before. We are calling upon Mr. President, the heads of security agencies, to go after these criminal elements whose interest is to instill fear, instill violence in River State. We as a party, we are not deterred. We are sure that they are getting the signal of Rivers people joining our party in preparation for the forthcoming local government election. And they want to undermine this good policy of the uh, amiable governor of River State. Who wants to conduct local government election? These people at first, they said that conduct local government election. The governor said plans in place to conduct local government election. We know how they have been shopping for one order or the other in all the courts in the Federation, trying to stop the local government uh, 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 forthcoming election. They have seen that they, have not, they are not able to achieve that. They have resorted to violence. They want to stop the process and the good policies of the governor at all costs. Just that as civilized people, as civilized people, will try not to be violent. But if anybody, those who have done this, have thought that this would deter us, unfortunately, it has given us more reserve to go on to do what we're supposed to do. Because it's a clear indication of defeat on their side. It's a clear indication that we are doing the right thing. And we will not be deterred in any form at all. This barbaric act, this uncivilized act of people who think that they are reservoirs of violence, who think that they are reservoirs of knowledge, who think that River State must cato whatever, whatever, whatever they want or whatever they, want, they, they interact. We have come to change the narrative. Whether anybody likes it or not, one thing that is constant in life is change. One thing that is constant in life is change. But the beauty of it is that the people are against them. The time is against them. Most importantly, God is against them. The truth of the matter is that PDP is emptied into a, a, a PP. We are, they are totally empty. And the earlier they understand that, the better for them. We are not deterred in any way. We are not deterred in any way. We are only asking that the governor of River State, he's been doing well, and he swore an oath to uphold 
the laws of this land to defend life and property, and he's doing that. We'll ask him to ensure and call on the security apparatus to do their to do the needful. You know, I heard about this uh, yesterday, and um, we deployed our teams to come here and take um, charge of the area. The bomb squad has been sent here, and I'm waiting for their report anywhere from now. But most importantly, everybody has to take their security very important. Uh, like I quickly sent in our officers in here yesterday, because anywhere there's explosion there's likely to be a second one. So we, usually we move people away from that. And that is what my team succeeded in doing yesterday. Now, there's been a lot of developments in this perspective. We've listened to the Commissioner of Police in River State, CP, to Jidisu. We've also listened to the Chairman of the APP, Mr. Sonde Kowurokoke. And uh, it's where Mr. Olamilikon had some, some thoughts about it. But on the other hand, listening to the national chairman, Mr. Mm. Uche Nanadi, mm -hmm. he also spoke about the fact that uh, the peace and, and uh, what I call it now, the peace and interest of the river people, aside from political interest, mm. should be first. Definitely. The CP is, is anticipating a reprisal attack. Definitely. Definitely, because, you know, when bombs, uh, 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 bomb uh, 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 happened that way, there could be a second bomb somewhere so but what we are just hoping that the peace will return to reverse particularly the war between Fubara as well as the uh, Minister of FCT wiki and uh, if you hear what the, the the state chairman of APP is talking about he said the people of uh, the people of PDP are envy of APP and the people of APP that uh, PDP is talking is not talking about the supporters of uh, Governor Fubara he's talking about the other side of PDP that belong to the wiki because we need to interrogate some of this happening in River State. It's about issues around Governor Fubara and his godfather. And that has transmitted and translated to issues whereby the local government thing that we are talking about that they want to conduct around. It have, would have been conducted earlier before now. You get it? So we need to interrogate all those excesses. And if not for the Supreme Court judgment, no local no governor will conduct local government uh, election. We have to tell ourselves the truth. If not for the Supreme Court judgment. And that's why I see that one of the persons said hey, they want to seize the treasures of reverse State. Because, because definitely if you don't conduct local government election by October, nobody will give you any allocation for local government. That's what it means. So it's about the treasury, it's about the political control of the state. And I made mention, I said, of all political parties that we have, why APP? Why would they want to move to APP? What stopped them from moving to LP? What stopped them from moving to APGA? You get it? These are other leading party in the state. They, they are not going there. But LP, as I uh, pointed out, they will always look for, a political strong person will always look for where he can have a control, a grip of the NWC of that political party. And that's why they be moving to APP. And as I pointed out, it could be an opportunity for them to, because PDP at national is not that too friendly with the governor and the state. So there is no way, even if they want to conduct uh, what they call it, the uh, local government uh, 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 nomination election for candidate, they may want to, there could be an interest that may not favor the governor. So you have to move to where it could be a favor to him. Then ask why they, are they not moving to APC? Or why is uh, the APP not accusing APC of bombing their, <laughs> their sectarians? Why pushing the blame? Because they are pushing the blame to a, an element in the PDP. So. What it tells us is that it is all about the interest, because there's no convergence of interest between the governor, his godfather, and other followers that belong to the two camps. While in suing for peace, it may seem as though that on the political scenes, parties have a hard time getting together. In River State, the APP Secretariat has been the latest sport of some perceived party disagreements amidst a rumored defection of the River State governor now, the smallest unit in society also suffers its own fair share of quarrels and a lack of peace. Yesterday, a video went viral at the Mutala Mohammed International Airport where a certain woman identified as Mrs. Favor Igebo mutilated her husband's passport, leaving him stranded as the family looked to sojourn outside the shores of Nigeria. Now, this morning, we hear, according to the Nigerian Immigration Service, following its amended act of 2015, that if indeed Mrs. Favor Igebo is found guilty, she might serve a jail term for mutilating the Nigerian passport. 
Now, this is one of those conversations that has sparked mixed reactions. Mrs. Favor Gabo has also taken to social media and put out her own side of the story. But first off, let's look at a press release as issued by the Nigerian Immigration Service following this development. Now, greeting your screens this morning is a press release dated 11th August 2024, signed by DCI KT Udo, Service Public Relations Officer following the service headquarters in Abuja stands on the matter. It has the subject, Nigerian Immigration Service investigates torn passport incidents at MIA Lagos. The Nigerian Immigration Service has launched a formal investigation following the circulation of a video on social media showing a female traveler destroying a Nigerian standard passport at the Murutala Mohammed International Airport, MMIA Lagos. The individual has been identified and invited for further investigation. If the allegations are substantiated, her actions would have constituted a breach of Section 10B of the Immigration Act 2015 as amended, with corresponding penalties outlined under Section 10H of some acts. The Nigerian Immigration Service remains steadfast in its commitment to upholding the provisions of the Immigration Act in the interest of national security and to preserving the dignity and integrity of the nation's, nation's legal instruments. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw a lot of reactions when that video went viral. Mm -hmm. Some Nigerians on social media were saying that the immigration officers ought to have arrested her in keeping with this. Mm -hmm. Others were asking how it has come of a culture mm -hmm. that we have embraced destruction, mm -hmm. bombing of secretaries, mm -hmm. partners destroying <laughs> television sets, Said. Hmm. destroying car screens, hmm. to tearing international passports Passport. at a point of traveling in front of the family. Her children hmm. were there when she did that. Exactly. Uh, although we might not understand the full scope of what Mrs. Favor said she has had to deal with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is resulting to violence hmm. the only way to go. Hmm. And do you think that this jail term in its severity, hmm. if she's found guilty, might be a deterrent? It, it, it will, it will. And because the judge, by the time she appeared before the judge, and they discover that, that she's really guilty, they may also add fine some payment on it because she has to pay for the damages of the international passport. But something uh, 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 flying out of that issue was that they were staying abroad before, that the man and the woman normally had issues, that the, the woman reported the, the man, the husband, to, to, the, to the security agencies over there where they were, in, in, either in UK or US where they reside. And the demand the for now has not been has been not been doing his right job and providing for the family. That the woman has been the one providing for the family. And when they came back to Nigeria, and it's like they, they were going back, the, the woman doesn't want the man to go with them. Those have been the stories that we are also hearing as part of it. Now, the immigration officer are not arresting the woman. When I was asked this question yesterday on the sister, she said, No, if they have done that, it would have turned out to be another story. Because the social media will still go ahead and say, ah, see how the Malandu, a particular Nigerian foreigner, whatever. You do. That coolness of that arrangement is better. They allow her to do what she wants to do. They not allow invite her, her for investigation. Not invite her for, for investigation, which is quite very good. So it's not left for the woman to now put up her defense, get a lawyer that will help us to be able to articulate her defense line. But if not, definitely she will serve a jail time. But it's also a lesson to a lot of Nigerians who are frustrated, whether with the system, Either with your own grown or uh, family issues, that you don't need to be displaying all this at the public. Mr. Lamilico, mm. as easy as it sounds, mm. people go through real life situations. Mm. Some issues, health, some issues, mm -hmm. life threatening, mm -hmm. some issues, financial, mm -hmm. the way the country is. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Nigerians frustrated. Mm. We saw much of it during the hashtag end bad governance protest. Exactly. How do you have Nigerians? much like yourself or much like people you call on mm. to still maintain some level of decorum and miss mm. their suffering. How, how do people get that mental strength? You have to. If you don't, you end up, you could you say you want to destroy something, you end up destroying yourself. That is just the fact. The the people that went rioting during the protest saying they want to go out, they went rioting and rampaging. I'm talking of not the real protesters. So, because the one I confronted when I was coming back from town, entering going back, the people we confronted on highway are not protesters. They were rioters, they are rampages, that people want to extort people coming all the way from town, coming all the way from work, as a result of the opportunity given to them in the protest. So those ones it's a, it destroy things, uh, loot things, you could end up uh, uh, destroying yourself. And those, like this kind of issue now, the woman that expressed those anger, it's good to express anger sometimes, but when you express it in a way that 
it now affect this the, the, the psyche of the entire Nigeria. So what have you achieved by that? Now she will be in a remote form now. No matter what the husband's offenses. At all. You she will be in a remote because by the time they begin to read out her charges to her, she now say, Hey, is this the level I've gone? Then she, maybe she will not say it is devil. They will not say no, devil was not with you when you are tearing tearing those passports. You did it consciously. You did it as a result of your anger. And you could not control your temper. So the issue is that we should all know how to control our temper. And there's no amount of uh, policy, bad policy that this government will bring in that should turn Nigerian to the madness of destroying infrastructure that billions upon billions have been spent on. Because as we speak right now, those infrastructure that are spoiled or destroyed in some state, procurement will go into it. The same people that we say are stealing the money, they will see usher there and give yourself the, uh, the contract to come and fix it. At the end of the day, who is losing? Now, the other angle one would wonder in this mm. is for a woman mm. who has been so much exposed, mm. because I believe travel is an education. Exactly. She has been able to travel outside the shores of the country. Mm -hmm. Whatever challenges she faced in a matrimonial home, mm -hmm. she probably should have been better aware of how to channel it through a legal redress. Mm. I don't know if it's the fear of stigmatization or whatever the issue might be in her mm. own opinion, mm. that she refrained from getting the law to take its course and resorted to taking the law upon herself. The, the issue is that look at uh, the, what she did. She tore the passport. Meaning that she doesn't want the man to go with them if they are going back to the state or where they are coming from. She doesn't want the man to go with them. And there are insinuations maybe the woman, maybe, maybe she has been engaged in some extramarital issues. That maybe because of the quietness of the husband, the husband is not having a job to do, he's still depending on her. The man doesn't want to talk. You get it? So, the issue still boils down to let us control our emotion. No matter how grievous the offense anybody has committed against you, in displaying, you, you, you can do, you can display, I'm, I'm very angry with you, I'm very sad about you, but destroying things is the one that is more dangerous. You destroy the property that you have spent money to buy or spend money to, to procure. You now destroy it because you are angry. Like this international, to get international passport, even though it's not too expensive or too costly, but the processes the procedure to get it is very idiot. tedious. Yes. So how do you now compare that now? Compare that now when the man will now go up, sit down, begin to look for another password to get for himself. So we want you to consider that. But the, the, the message is that let us all control our anger. No matter how, uh, how angry we are with our society, with our system. There are some people that are very angry in America. The same challenge, global economy challenge that we have in Nigeria. A lot of people are source in developed climate. It's just that they cause uh, we don't see it on TV. It is not being reported on media. A lot of us that watch reality, because some of, uh, as part of my research engagement, I don't just watch CNN and the other, I also watch reality programs of what is happening across the world. Those reality programs show you the real picture of what is happening in those countries. When I was making citing issues around Asian Tigers, it is from those reality that we say, okay, this is what these people are doing, and this our government is encouraging them to get to the level they are. But most of us, we are so covered or so, I mean, so enticed to watching movies from the developed clients showing us the beautiful area of their countries, the beautiful government things and the rest of them. But the other side of it, we don't see it. And it's not being reported. And on social media, we don't even get to watch it or see it. You get it? So if we endeavor to understand some of the reality that's happening around the world, we know that Nigerian pe case is peculiar and we can solve it. The only thing is that this crop of leaders that we have, we they need to we need to talk into them so that they can change. Because if we don't, if we keep quiet, like the way I do my analysis, we bring out the objectivity of what is happening. They also bring out the criticism of what is happening so that we can balance it. Like we said this morning on the 30 uh, buses that are being launched. Is that what they promise us? No. They promise us 3,000 CNG buses. So where is the 2,970 buses? So we should keep advocating that President Nubu endeavor to launch the remaining 2,070 buses, because 30, 30 buses that you promised, the launch is not what you promise us. Well, I really enjoyed your objectivity today. I'm very sure, much like our viewers at home this morning, mm. we appreciate you for taking our time to expansively discuss issues in the news with us this morning. Thanks for having me.